May I speak in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Everyone serves the good wine first, and then the inferior wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. I wonder... Are you one of those people who feel bad about feeling good? There are some, maybe more than we think, who seem to think that in order to be a good Christian, they always have to be denying themselves, always making sacrifices. If they go out to have a good time, they come back afterwards with guilty feelings. If they think they are really enjoying life, there must be something wrong. They're being too worldly. Yet in the passage we've just heard from John's Gospel, we have a story about Jesus and his mother and his disciples taking part in a friend's wedding party. Do we feel that Jesus should have just attended the wedding ceremony, the religious part, and kept away from the festivities? Or do we have a problem with Mary enjoying a glass or two of wine? Not only that, When the wine runs out, Jesus is the one who sees that there's a plentiful supply. In fact, he provides them with so much that they could not possibly have drunk it all. One clear message of today's lecture readings is that our Christian religion is a religion of joy. The genuine Christian really knows how to enjoy life. So many Christians have such a gloomy outlook on life and an even more gloomy attitude towards their religion. When you go into an average church on a Sunday morning, do you always get the impression that this is really a happy bunch of people who have come to celebrate? For many people, religion, the Christian religion, seems a terribly serious business. The theme of John's Gospel is that Jesus is the source of life. In chapter 10, Jesus says, I have come in order that you might have life, life in all its fullness. If then you are one of those people who feel that to be a Christian is a burden, then it seems that you have not yet grasped the meaning of Christ's message. To be a Christian is to experience a real sense of liberation to experience a new life, a new sense of happiness, a new peace, a new relationship with people. During the recent Christmas season, and up to now, we've seen God revealing himself through Jesus in several ways. Firstly, when Jesus was born, as a refugee and homeless person, lying in an animal's feeding box, God is revealing himself in his solidarity with the poor and needy of the world. The first people to visit him are the poor and social outcasts, the shepherds. They recognize their God and worship him with hearts full of joy. Secondly, God reveals himself to the foreigners, strangers, believers in other religions and no religions coming from remote parts of the world. This happens on the Feast of the Epiphany, when we remember those wise men who come from a far country to worship and offer precious gifts. Again, the atmosphere is one of joy and gladness. Thirdly, God reveals himself when Jesus is baptized in the River Jordan and is filled with the Spirit of God of this young carpenter, at this stage still a non-entity in the crowd, it is said, this is my beloved son. Listen to him. To listen to this young man Jesus is to listen to God himself. And now today, for a fourth time in John's Gospel, God reveals himself when Jesus performs his first sign. Remember, John doesn't call them miracles, but signs. Signs of God's acting among his people. There will be seven such signs altogether in his gospel. 
And a sign, of course, points beyond itself to something much deeper. To understand today's story, we need to be aware that like much of John's writing, it is full of symbolic language. We would miss uh, so much if we were to see here only a miracle by which Jesus helps a young bridegroom who finds himself in an embarrassing position on his wedding day when the wine runs out. This is a parable about the transforming presence of Jesus and takes us right to the very heart of the Christian gospel. Today's gospel says there were six stone jars full of water. They were there for the ceremonies of purification which were required by tradition on coming into the house and before and after eating. In this story, they represent the laws and religious customs of the Jews. And notice there are six, six jars, which is one short of the complete number, seven. The Jews regarded seven as the perfect and complete number. And John tends to give a lot of meaning to numbers, especially that number seven here in his gospel. Through the intervention of Jesus, the water in these jars is transformed into wine. And a first-class wine at that, the best wine. And this wine represents the Christian testament, the new life, the new way of Jesus. It takes the place of the lifeless water of the Old Covenant, the Old Testament. And this involved washings and sacrifices which still left people apart from God. A similar image is presented in the other Gospels. In the confrontation between the Jewish leaders and Jesus, Jesus speaks of the new wine which cannot be put into old containers. The new wine which he gives needs new wineskins. In other words, the new vision of life that Jesus brings can only be understood by leaving behind the old traditional ways of thinking and doing. In other words, without Jesus, life is inessentially incomplete. There's something missing. In this story, John is trying to drive home a contrast. The contrast between the old Jewish order of things, which was based on trying to observe the law, trying to be good, and the new Christian order of things, which springs from the grace and truth brought into the world by Jesus, and which consists not in trying to be good, but in rejoicing in the generosity of God. And there's an awful lot of wine. Each jar, we're told, could hold up to 20 or 30 gallons. In total, I suppose, about 150 gallons, or 1,000 bottles of wine. Even the grandest party thrown by the super-rich would hardly provide that much. And this is just a village wedding. But we miss the point if we take that with an unimaginative literalism. Again, this is a symbol of the generosity and liberality of God and the fullness of life which he wants us to experience. It reminds us of the feeding of vast numbers of people in the desert when so much was left over. God wants to give us life, life in abundance. So there's no no need to feel bad about feeling good. No one should be enjoying life more than the disciple of Jesus. And remember, all this is taking place at a wedding banquet. In the Old Testament, as Isaiah indicates, Israel was visualized as the bride of God. In the New Testament, the church, the Christian community, is the bride of Christ. And this image is spelt out in Paul's letter to the Ephesians, where it's also linked uh, to marriage. When we wish to celebrate a wedding, a birthday, an anniversary, or whatever, we normally sit down together to eat. In the scripture too, life with God and with Jesus is pictured as a banquet. 
a foretaste of the heavenly banquet to come. It's not a time for self-denial and sacrifice, but a time to enjoy and be happy together. Why should the disciples fast when the bridegroom is with them? And so this wedding at Cana reminds us of the meal we celebrate every Sunday, the Eucharist or Holy Communion, when we gather to eat and drink around the table of the Lord. The Eucharist is a time of celebration. There's something sadly missing if we find it a boring experience, a kind of sacrifice or even a duty. It's a time for celebration. And what is there to celebrate? At its deepest, we celebrate all that God has done for us in Jesus Christ through his life, his teaching, his suffering, his death and glorious resurrection, all signs of God's overwhelming love for us. In the second reading too, Paul reminds us of the treasury of gifts that has been given to each one of us. These gifts are not merely to be used for ourselves. They are the means, the talents we have been given through which we make our unique contribution to our Christian community and to the overall task of building a society based on love, justice, freedom, and peace. And we have much to celebrate and be thankful for. Because there are so many people who have used their gifts to promote our well-being and help us in our needs. The degree to which each of us does this decides the level of celebration in our Eucharist. Have we been using our gifts for each other as much as we should? That's the challenge. Finally, Mary is there at the feast. It was through her sensitive awareness that Jesus came to know about the bridegroom's predicament. In this story, she not only, she's not only the mother of Jesus, she also represents the church. It is through the Christian community that Jesus comes to us. It is through the church, through our brothers and sisters in the community, that we learn about the life that God in Jesus wants us to enjoy and share with him. Through the church, we receive the help we need to lead that full life. And through you and through me, because we too are members of that community, Others are helped to fullness of life. And so in our second, in our epistle this morning, Paul speaks of the unique gifts that each one has been given. These gifts have one purpose only, the building up of the community to greater fullness of life. That is the life of the church. We all give and we all receive. So what will you give, what will I give, to help others towards enjoying a fuller and happier life? So remember this story of the uh, wedding at Cana is a story of transformation. Yes, from water into wine, but far more deeply about the transformation of our lives as we follow Jesus. It is only in the company and friendship of Jesus Christ that life becomes really satisfying. Life with Christ is far more colourful, far richer, broader, and with a greater added value than anything the world has to offer. This is the new wine, the new joy of the kingdom of God. Praise be to God. Alleluia. Amen.